Hi, my dear readers and my dear viewers, I mean readers and viewers of my, uh, of my scientific blog Discover Social Sciences, which those last days is transforming into something like a written blog crossed with a, with a video blog. Uh, the thing is that as uh, we all are, well, most of us are in that lockdown due to the virus, to, the, to COVID-19, uh, I noticed that I miss giving classes and I noticed that uh, when I speak even to an imaginary audience I can sort of get across a message that is much harder to me to get across when I'm just writing. Uh, so during that lockdown I have changed or I am changing a little bit my form of expression on my scientific blog. Anyway, uh, below the video you will see a description, of course. In the description you will see a link uh, to, uh, uh, to the website of my scientific blog, Discover Social Sciences. So you can click on the link and find more uh, written content. Now, that written content might not exactly correspond to what I am discussing in this video, because it is a blog, it is like a scientific journal. Uh, it is not completely structured. Uh, so, essentially, I am using you, my viewers, as uh, what my son calls a rubber duck. Uh, in the world of computer engineers, a rubber duck is an imaginary audience to which you speak when you try to like get some clarity in your ideas. So, in this, uh, in this video, in this update. Uh, I am discussing, I am trying to get some clarity in my ideas as regards my research on collective intelligence. Here are a few words of explanation before I go further. Uh, for like one year, maybe a little bit more than one year, I have been fascinated with the absolute fundamentals of artificial intelligence when I started meddling a little bit with uh, neural networks, very simple ones. Huh? Just, I explain I am not a programmer, I am just like a neophyte uh, with a lot of enthusiasm for the thing. So when I started to experiment with neural networks, um, I discovered in me a deep fascination with the way that neural networks weigh, with the way they reflect like true human intelligence, or what I think is true human intelligence. For the moment, I gave to that research a title. It is Climbing the Right Hill, because I'm uh, making like a strong association between uh, the concept of collective intelligence, on the one hand, a biological theory called uh, adaptive walk in rugged landscape, uh, and precisely the usage of artificial intelligence, the usage of uh, neural networks. And in that biological theory, in that evolutionary theory of an adaptive walk in a rugged landscape, there is that um, concept or that notion of climbing a hill along a rugged, uh, a rugged path. Uh, so this is like the uh, general title to my research. Uh, I'm essentially d d doing this video because I have already sent around a few papers uh, to various scientific journals where I presented my ideas about using a neural network to emulate collective intelligence of human societies. And each time I received this paper back, I received those draft ar articles back from the editor or from the uh, viewers with a general remark that it sounds nice, man, but you need to clarify, to, you really need to clarify what do you understand by collective intelligence and how do you see the bridging between the way a neural network works and the way you suppose collective intelligence works. So this is what this video serves me to and I hope it will be enriching for you somehow. So First of all, the roots of my fascination uh, with the collective intelligence and uh, with the usage of uh, neural networks. Essentially, I, can, I have three empirical experiences, or I can recall 
three empirical experiences of mine which sort of directed me on that path. Uh, first of all, when I observed, when I, as I have been observing for more than three years uh, now, uh, financial markets and economic systems, I noticed a deep change in those financial markets. I will return to it in a subsequent, uh, or with a subsequent slide in this video. For the moment, I just can tell you that uh, in financial markets, there is a substantial change, as if financial markets were an endocrine system which helps our collective intelligence. Uh, then I did some research with neural networks. I did some simulations and I was sort of fascinated with the way that neural networks use error. Error, which in classical stochastic models is something that essentially is an annoyance, a disturbance that we try to eliminate, in a neural network is used, is exploited to find a solution. So it is very similar to human learning. We humans, we learn by trial and error. And finally, uh, the third empirical experience, it was the observation of hornets in my garden. Hornets, you know, there are the, these are those uh, big insects like a wasp on steroids. And in a moment I will explain those three experiences of mine, how they influenced my research. So, first of all, that, that, that thing about the hornets. Uh, the context is that in my garden I have lilac bushes. Uh, hornets come, especially in late spring, uh, to collect bark from those lilac bushes. Uh, they use, apparently, they use that bark to build their nests. I haven't found any hornet nests close to my house, fortunately, yet they come to my garden and those encounters are partly interesting, partly scary. Anyway, it looks like that. First of all, there is one hornet that comes and sort of just hovers around. Huh? And one hornet is really dumb as hell. Uh, you wouldn't believe how slow and how sort of no vigilant is a single hornet. But when they want to collect bark from my, garner, uh, uh, from my garden, they come in teams of two. And when they come in a team of two, it is completely different. Suddenly they coordinate, they are efficient, they have roles. There is one hornet that really collects bark from the branches of my lilac bushes. And there is another hornet who is like the bodyguard. Uh, when I approach, that other hornet tries to uh, attract my attention, tries to distract me. It uh, does those strange evolutions like Messerschmitt style to scare me off. Uh, so my thing is that how the fact of being together can affect the behavior of those hornets so deeply. Those insects have hardly any brains at all. Hmm? They don't really have social instincts in the way that we have. So there must be something like very deeply rooted in the nervous systems of all animals, of all species, as in included, which makes us collectively intelligent. Now I pass to another thing, uh, to another component of my experience. Uh, it is the observation that neural networks work. Uh, here one remark uh, as for uh, let's say as for how uh, as for how um, I address this video when I talk about neural networks I assume that viewers who are watching this video have an elementary understanding of how a simple neural network the so-called perceptron works huh? uh, I will discuss a few aspects of it in a moment but for the moment, I assume that you just know. So in a neural network, we have a chain of equations which exploit the fact of uh, making an error of estimation. Essentially, what we want in a neural network is to make errors so as to learn something. Huh? And um, I have like a intuition. It is an intuitive thought. I don't even know if any data scientist would agree with me on that point, that neural networks use error as a kind of uh, 
logical hormone, uh, as a hormone that facilitates learning in something that is collective. Because a neural network learns on a set of data, and in that set of data, we can imagine that each single observation is an entity. And uh, learning as performed by a neural network can be seen as learning uh, performed by a collective of entities. Mm -hmm. And uh, at, at this point I asked myself like two what-if questions. First of all, what if a society was a neural network? So what if our human societies worked as a collection of entities which more or less randomly generate error and learn through that error? And the second thing is, what if we, individual humans, were those units of communication? What if uh, the, really, the real biological entity was the society and not the in individual? And what if we individuals were just units of co communication? Uh, units which communicate information about what works in real life, what doesn't really work. Hmm? That's the, the, the kind of tricky path that I am engaging myself into. Now my third experience, my third empirical experience, the graph that you can see in that slide next to me is uh, the graph which shows the supply of broad money in the global economy, so in the economy of the planet, uh, as a percentage of the global GDP, so as a percentage of uh, the global real output. This data comes from the website of the World Bank. and. Uh, what can be ob observed is that over uh, the last decades, since 1960, since, so since those statistics uh, have been captured, we accumulate more and more money in relation to real output in the global financial system. It looks like the build-up of hormone. I frequently return to that concept of hormone because a hormone is essentially a piece of information uh, that gets dropped in the system and anyone can use it. Huh? And this is very much how I see it. I will, tell, I, I will show it in a subsequent slide. But here we have that monetary thing. So we have more and more money in the world per unit of real output. And if I assume that money is a social hormone, is a, in, is a piece of information that is supposed to trigger some behavior in, in people, if we accumulate more and more money in relation to real output, it means that we accumulate more and more like latent, dormant information in relation to the real amount of resources that we have. It is a little bit as if a human body was accumulating like serotonin or adrenaline just in order to, to, to do something. Eh? So my deep intuition is that for decades, we have been preparing our civilization like for doing something, for maybe for a technological jump. So here I come to that idea that uh, when we coordinate with information, we coordinate more and more with information that takes the form like of drops or droplets. Because even now, when I am addressing this video to you, my viewers and my readers, even now, I don't really know whom am I addressing. Mm -hmm. uh, in front of me, I have a computer screen. I just see my own face on that screen. And I don't know who will be viewing this video, who will be watching it and listening to it. And I don't know who will be reading my scientific blog. So I am dropping like a parcel of information in the system assuming that someone maybe will react somehow. That's the idea. And my idea is that all the digital technology that we have created so far is very much like that. Instead of addressing a precise person or a precise audience with the message that I am trying to get across, I create like a parcel, like a drop of in information, a droplet, like a drop of water. And I just... Uh, and I just uh, let it go into the system. 
This is, by the way, uh, a, a theory. There is a, a theory that corresponds to that concept. It is the, the so-called swarm theory. The swarm theory precisely connects to the way that uh, insects like bees or ants or hornets behave. Huh? Uh, so the, the, the swarm theory assumes that social systems, like ours, uh, can coordinate through tacit coordination precisely by spreading around those parcels of information in a partly random way. So we drop around information about successes and failures and other people pick it up and in that way we learn collectively something. Now a big question that I have been asking myself and that my reviewers and the editors of those journals have pointed me to, why do I use the concept of collective intelligence instead of using the concept of culture or instead of using the concept of individual intelligence? This is very intuitive from my part, uh, because on the one hand I distinguish collective intelligence from individual intelligence, uh, because individual intelligence is essentially based on representation of reality. Hmm? Our brain transforms uh, like the reality we are confronted with into a set of signals and we work with those signals. So we work with representations rather than with reality as such. And culture, at least to the extent that we can phrase this culture out, at least to the extent that we are conscious of the culture that we are plunged into, is very much based on uh, on those individual representations. My intuition about collective intelligence, so my intuition about that um, coordination with drops of information like circling around like a hormone, it intuitively directs me towards our unconscious or towards our subconscious. I see that collective intelligence very much in the way that uh, Jung used to see his archetypes. Huh? It is something like an, like an archetypical shadow component uh, of our thinking. My point is that we can be collectively intelligent without being aware at all that we are collectively intelligent. We can be persuaded that we do things just by ourselves, just by individual de de decisions, but underneath there is that component of collectively intelligent adaptation, like an adaptive walk in rugged landscape. Now a few words about my method of using neural networks. Because in general, in social sciences, neural networks are, all, all, are already an accepted way of doing quantitative research and of verifying uh, empirical quantitative models. Only I noticed, at least in the literature that I found, that neural networks in quantitative research in social sciences are being used as an optimization tool. So they are just used as a more sophisticated version of the classical stochastic models that we have been using earlier or and that, that we keep using, by the way. Huh? Uh, the key fact is that in that specific approach to neural networks, we want the outcome, we want the final outcome. Hmm? Now, me, when I started to work with neural networks, I did something uh, that made my own son just bend into from laughter, because my son is a computer engineer, is he is a data scientist. And when I started to work with neural networks, I was very particular about splitting each consecutive iteration of the neural network into like very small steps and I observed each step separately. My son tried to explain it to me that he, he said, uh, look that what we are working with is an algorithm. An algorithm is supposed to do some work so as you don't have to do this work. If you observe very closely each consecutive step 
each consecutive iteration that the neural network does, you are, you are essentially doing the work that the algorithm should save you. But I can't help it. I am fascinated with the work that those, uh, or with the way that those neural networks learn. So my take on the usage of neural networks in social sciences is precisely observing the mechanics of learning. So uh, I want to observe and I want to develop an understanding of how the network works more than uh, like waiting for an optimized final outcome. Hmm? It is, by the way, an important thing uh, that the data scientists can put you to that uh, if you have an outcome, if you have a final result from a neural network, you don't really know if it is accurate until you confront it with some kind of validation system. Hmm? So um, I am most of all interested in connecting the way a neural network processes information with the way we collectively change and adapt. And I assume that uh, mathematical functions that we use in a neural network, uh, those functions reflect or represent the ways we think, because mathematics are essentially an account of how we think. Even if we are not fully aware that we use those thinking patterns. Huh? So here I am going to, in the two next slides, I am going to explain a little bit the basics of that connection between the mathematical functions in a neural network and the way I think we think collectively. So the first thing is that, that uh, most elementary mathematical transformation that you can see in um, even the simplest neural networks, in those simple perceptrons, it is the mathematical perception. So we have a set of data, like raw data, raw reality, composed of a certain number of observations. And then we transform that whole vector, that whole cloud of empirical observations into like one number, which here I call the, the perceived x. Hmm? And the formula that you can see in the slide is a, a generalization of what you can see in many algorithms of neural networks. So essentially I take each individual empirical observation, like a number, I multiply it, so I, I weight with a random coefficient random between 0 and 1 or between minus 1 and 1. It depends on the exact formulation of the neural network that we use. And additionally, I can multiply it by a stochastic component. Uh, so by some kind of regularity, like mean reversion, like Poisson process and so on. It is not free, uh, I personally, when I construct my neural networks that I use in my research, in my networks, that stochastic component is the so-called fitness function. So the uh, average, the Euclidean distance between the given empirical observation and other observations in the same, in the same line of the database. So we think in terms or we think in terms of perceived compound phenomena not in terms of what is really happening it is important to understand that the neural net, na, uh, that the way that a neural network processes raw empirical data is very similar to the way we think we think when we think for example about the color red the color red is a compound phenomenon. It is a compound phenomenon made of many individual experiences that we have had during our life. When we think about, let's say, the taste of sugar or the touch of wool, it is the same thing. It is a very compound phenomenon transformed many times by our nervous system. In that compound phenomenon, so in that perception, we have usually, an, so we have the raw reality, the raw cloud of data. We have an aleatory component because, um, because each consecutive experience which we add to our learning includes that component of random conditions. 
Sometimes it is cold, sometimes it is hot, sometimes it is good weather, sometimes it is bad weather. Sometimes we are in a good mood, sometimes we are in a bad mood. This is this aleatory component which is not completely previsible. And the stochastic component of that formula that I am showing in the slide corresponds to our accumulated learning. There is a saying that I heard online, I think it was in one of the online lectures by Jordan Peterson, who said that we essentially we learn in order to stop learning. So when we learn, we develop in our brain some patterns, some constructs, and each consecutive information that we acquire gets filtered through those acquired concepts, through those acquired structures. And the stochastic component of this equation on the, on the slide next to me is precisely that accumulated past structured knowledge, which forms like a structured vessel to absorb any new piece of information. Okay, and finally, like in the last slide of this presentation, uh, I go a little bit into studying two most, uh, most used or, or, two, or no, let's say two most fundamental uh, functions used in neural networks. They are called neural activation functions. Uh, those functions are essentially the ways that the acquired signal, so the perceived X, is supposed to be transformed into some kind of output. So here I show two functions, the sigmoid, the, or to be, to be specific, the sigmoid logistic. It is the upper equation in the slide with the sig prefix. And I discuss the, the hyperbolic tangent or tan h, which is uh, the equation at the bottom of the slide. So you can see in the slide, if you give yourself some time, you can see the mathematical formulation of those functions. You can see that each time you have the constant e and you have 1 and the combination of 1 and the constant e in each of those uh, in each of those functions is essentially a constant in itself. So to that extent in each of those functions both in the in the sigmoid logistic and in the hyperbolic tangent, we have a constant component, which is like a constant way of thinking, a constant structure. And to this, we add that perceived X, which I discussed in my previous slide, huh? so that compound perception made out of raw data. Now I noticed about those two functions, I noticed that they give different results when applied to the same set of data. In general, the sigmoid logistics is like a calming function. It is uh, the way of thinking which essentially is like, okay, let's calm down. Whatever happens, we can structure it. Whatever happens, we can sort of smooth it down into like a gentle change. Whilst the hyperbolic tangent is different. It uh, gets very, if I can use that word, it gets sort of very excited with new, uh, with new values of that perceived X. The, hyper, the hyperbolic tangent like very easily goes like completely off the rails as uh, it comes to generating the output function or the output variable. Uh, besides, uh, when the raw data, when, so when the number of variables that we include in the perceived x grows, the sigmoid function essentially doesn't react to complexity. But the hyperbolic tangent reacts. The more complex is the raw data that we are processing, the more swings and the strongest swings I can observe in the hyperbolic tangent when I use it as a neural activation function. So we have two ways of thinking, like two patterns. One pattern which essentially doesn't care about complexity in the external reality. It is that extremely simplifying way of thinking. 
And on the other hand, we have a pattern of reaction, a pattern of thinking, which is very sensitive to complexity. So in the presence of more complex data, it needs like more time to learn. It generates a different result. Okay, so these are my loose thoughts about collective intelligence. Once again, I have just used you, my viewers and, and, and my readers, as the rubber duck, so as that imaginary creature in Latin, Anas flexilis, uh, to which I talk in order to like get my own thoughts straight. I hope it has been inspiring somehow. And uh, once again, if you want to go to the website of my blog, if you want to read some written content, you click on the link that you will find in the description below the video. So have a nice day and have a nice science, essentially. Bye.